This is Season 7 of the Team Roping Journal's podcast, The Score, the show that started it all in the whole podcasting game in Team Roping and Rodeo. At 3 million downloads and counting, this is where Team Ropers talk, from our weekly short score episodes to the longer sit-down conversations that we get to have that dive deep into the personalities, producers, and horses that inspire the sport. This is where Team Ropers get their must-know information. Hey everyone, this is Chelsea Schaefer. Welcome to The Score. Today's episode's a little different. We've got a crossover episode with two of my really good friends who talked about uh, a subject that I'm pretty passionate about, so I wanted to share it with you. We're going to take a little break from the retirement series, but that's only because I wanted to get you all this episode this week because uh, this is an episode with Kenzie Meyer, who is the owner of Elite Equine Promotions and... Kayla Jones, who is over at the Money Barrel podcast, one of our sister podcasts. Uh, These girls are two of my best friends, and they are both brilliant at what they do. Kayla is very good at marketing incentives and understanding the barrel horse industry, and Kenzie is a master of marketing rope horses. And so Kenzie and Kayla go through all of the ins and outs of marketing horses. We're getting on to or getting into fall sale season. Uh, I know it's July, but it feels like everybody's starting to sale fit their young colts and get ready for the fall sales and get ready for all the big fall events. Uh, Western Bloodstock sale at the NRCHA uh, futurity, the Riata sale coming up in December. People are already thinking about what horses they're going to put at the Riata sale uh, at the World Series finale. So there's a lot going on. And uh, th- these two are very good at explaining all the ins and outs of marketing your rope horses, marketing your barrel horses, getting everything ready for sale season, and how to best make a buck in the sale business. So this is an episode from the Money Barrel podcast. It was uh, That's our sister podcast that came out last week. But I figure there's just not a ton of crossover between the barrel racers and the team ropers, and you all probably haven't heard it yet. So enjoy today's episode of The Score, given to us by our friends at The Money Barrel. Today's episode is brought to you by our partners at Cactus Saddlery. When we first said we were going to highlight the rope horse futurity industry and the horse industry, Cactus Saddles jumped on board from day one and said they wanted to be a part of it. So thank you to Cactus Saddlery for your support of the growth of the horse market. I'll tell you more about them on the commercial break. This is an episode I am really excited about. We have Kenzie Mayer of Elite Equine Promotions, and we are going to be talking about all things marketing, business, brand building, 101, all the very most important things to get names out there in the industry and for your stallion. So Kenzie, thank you so much for giving us time to share a little bit of your secrets. Yeah, thank you. I'm super excited to talk to you guys and kind of maybe about some things that don't get talked about a lot, kind of the inside look into marketing and more so equine marketing, because that's totally different than, you know, maybe some commercial marketing in other industries and stuff. So I'm really excited to share. Yeah, this is going to be awesome. Um, I'm, I got Kenzie's name and her Facebook through our friends and Casey and Chelsea, and I've been just such a fan of your work and the videos and, you know, the ads and everything that you do. And that is one thing between um, my stallion incentive that I've seen and just overall events is that like marketing nowadays is so vital to any of our success in the industry because it's so competitive. Um, but I really feel like the barrel racing industry like can learn some things from outside of um, you know our little area of it. So tell us a little bit about Elite Equine Promotions and how you even got into this career path. For sure, yeah. So Elite Equine Promotions, um, it's essentially a marketing agency. Um, we don't just do marketing. I do photography and videography, kind of some you know content creation, basically just every piece of the pie that goes into marketing. So my idea was when you hire me, you know, it's taken care of. You don't have to go outsource to other things. Like we just, we do all of it. And I got started in it. I don't, I've done a little bit of like photography, sports photography in high school. And then it was funny. I was actually working for a horse trainer while I was in college 
And I would like, you know, take videos of the horses that we rode every day and kind of mash them up into little videos. And then I asked him like, hey, can we post these on your Facebook for the customers and stuff to see? And he was like, yeah. So we kind of did a little bit of that and it was like a light bulb went off in my head. I was like, there's a definite need for this in the industry. Like not only for the customers, but just like to promote horse trainers and businesses in the industry. So not to mention, I didn't really enjoy waking up at three o'clock in the morning to clean stalls every day. So I was like, if I can do this and go to the horse shows and still get to go and be around it and stuff, but just kind of do that kind of work instead. I just wanted to see if it worked. And I thought, you know, maybe it'd be something I would do on the side, get a couple clients and then go work for a larger agency. And I just kind of stuck my neck out there and went to some horse shows and some sales and was lucky enough to meet the right people along the way. Next thing you knew, I looked up and I was like, well, this is my full-time job. Like (laughs) I have enough customers. I'm doing this every day. And um, I moved to North Texas and just kind of built a clientele there. And it really just took off. I was really blessed. So that's so awesome. And like I said, I love that it's, it's not just sale pictures. Like you have a little bit of everything that you do. And I really feel like that's yeah. you know what I'm excited to talk about. Kind of like the full package. Um, where yeah, I love the variety because mm-hmm. like not every day is the same. Some days I'm going to take pictures. Some days I'm going to the horse show, horse sale. Like it's just different all the time and it keeps me fresh too. And it's going to be confusing because every time I say we're in the industry, because obviously we're talking about like the (laughs) Western industry as a whole, but like, what is your main clientele? Like, what is the events or, you know, that you, in the horse type that you focus on? People always ask me that. Um, I kind of lean towards saying like the rope horse industry is kind of my niche, but I do have cow horse and reining clients and some barrel horse clients like I do a lot of stuff um, for some like younger racehorse people. So I have a pretty big variety, but I would say most of my time, if I looked at the year in whole, is like going to rope horse fraternities and um, promoting trainers for those types of events. What do you think? I don't, I don't even know how to word this correctly, but I feel like, especially through, you know, Chelsea and me like learning from afar, like I feel like team roping and the rope horse world is so far advanced in their marketing in yeah. their TikToks for how relatively new their breeding is. Like on the barrel horse side, I mean, we have been specifically breeding barrel horses for 10, 15 right. years and, you know, have all these programs built. But like, what do you think made the team ropers like latch on to that marketing to just skyrocket these breeding programs? Yeah, I mean, it really, like, since I started within the past five years, the rope horse industry has just come full circle. Like, now we have hundreds of junior sires for rope horses, and they're paid into all of these incentives. So, I mean, definitely the marketing and the social media really brought a lot of attention to it. Mm -hmm. And then kind of, like, the incentives and the marketing that even the incentives has offered, you know, because we have all these new programs and people are getting hired to market those. So it kind of all just works. You know, we see a little bit of stuff like from the barrel securities and some of the bigger stuff, but I feel like if they kind of went all in with the marketing and stuff, and I think there's a lot of, I mean, I'm not super familiar with the barrel horse security world, but I know there's a decent amount of money in it. I feel like if they just brought more attention to it, you would see, a a great growth in it just like we've kind of seen in the rope horse industry yeah I totally agree um and that's like even you know the the team roping journal and just everything that I've seen I'm like we've we can level up like we can continue to get better um especially there's always room for improvement on anything yeah for sure um so I guess let's like just dive in like what is marketing what is your definition of marketing when you're talking to somebody marketing to me well i i ideally it's the spread of information and then equine marketing kind of just puts a targeted audience on that so we're obviously talking about within the horse industry and kind of leaning towards the barrel horse thing but um marketing 
you know, we're kind of talking about social media marketing, but I focus in other areas too. Like I use Google ads and some Google analytics. And then obviously we have publications like journals or quarter horse news, you know, there's still magazines that people put ads in and kind of all of it working together is, is what marketing is, but really it's just the spread of information. So like when you have a stallion, obviously you're trying to spread information about your horse and kind of promote him to the public. Same thing when you have maybe a horse sale or an event coming up, you're just spreading information about it, you know, kind of trying to attract people to it. So So that's what marketing is to me. When a client comes to you and says like, I have a stallion, what do I need to do? Like, what are the first couple steps you take to start getting that name out there? Yeah. So I would ask them, you know, whether or not they have already established an online presence for their horse, meaning like, do they have a Facebook, Instagram page, um, website, um, anything like that. And if not, that's where we start. And then the second step is to kind of look at, okay, what kind of content do you have of your horse? You know, has your horse ran or has it been in a show? Do you have any accolades? Just kind of I like to get to know the horse before I kind of start um, working with it. And I also want to know what the customer's goal is with their stallion. You know, if someone comes to me with a junior sire that's not totally established yet and they tell me they want to breed 200 mares, I'm going to kind of look at whether I think that's possible or not. And I'm going to be straight up with them. And then I'm going to make them, you know, the last step would be to make a marketing you know, plan for their horse or kind of a content schedule and just say, well, in order to achieve that, this is what I think we need to do. So that's kind of a glimpse of what it looks like whenever somebody calls me to promote a horse to the public. So we've had some conversations with stallion owners before, and obviously in the barrel racing industry, we have so many stallions and a lot of people new and old in the industry have opinions on like incentives making or breaking it. And from my view Mm -hmm. of like an incentive owner, I really truly feel that like marketing can over, not overdo everything. Like you have to be in some incentives. That's probably like the nature of the beast. But like if people say, I don't have a very good Facebook or I don't have an Instagram, like what is the importance of having those free social platforms And how often are you engaging on those to, like, drive people to that page? Yeah, I like how you use the word free because you're right. It is essentially free. Like, it's an opportunity to maybe introduce or get people to know your horse that aren't familiar with it. You know, if you if you don't have those things, I think you're just kind of limiting yourself to the clientele that you could possibly have. So. Um, As far as engagement goes, I mean, obviously, you want to work with as much content as you can, and you want to engage with your customers and the public online as much as you can. But another thing I kind of press on is the quality of your stuff is also really important. Like, you don't really want to post every day if the stuff you're posting isn't very good, because it's just not going to travel across, you know, the algorithms like you want it to. So, I mean, if you have a young horse that's out there showing or going to competitions and you have a lot of content, you could post every day about it. And that's great because you're kind of training your followers to look for it. You know, like Mm -hmm. if they expect to see stuff, like some people post before the event, like my horse is going to be running here. And then people kind of expect to see it. You can kind of work your way above the algorithm and just train your followers to interact with your stuff and that really helps you your online presence grow let's define good versus bad content and I'm not like I'm not for those listening like I'm not picking on anything but like we all know when we see certain things that we're like wow that is really high quality videos versus you know Mm -hmm. stuff taken at home but we also know that it's equally as important to like showcase those animals in their natural habitat, but there's still like good ways to do it. So what is your, like define that a little bit so people know what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, like you, like you kind of hinted at, it can be kind of a touchy subject because you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but also like 
you can make a really good horse look really bad if you're not, you know, careful with the stuff that you publish. So even if you're not yet to the point where you've hired a professional to come out and do some stuff, or maybe you, like you said, you just want to show them at home in their natural clothes, there's still a way to kind of represent your horse in a positive way. Like even if you're taking a picture on your cell phone of your horse standing tied to the stall, you know, you don't want their legs spread out and have them standing like a donkey for the lack of a better term. Like, you know, you kind of want them stood up right. And same thing goes for when you're taking professional content. You know, I really, I think it's really important to have someone hired or to kind of go and learn what what looks good and what doesn't Mm -hmm. and especially in the horse world it takes a pretty good eye for how to stand a horse up I mean you can't just hire any photographer you know like a people photographer to come out and they're not going to know how to stand your horse up to make them look good you know yeah, that so, is an experience I learned. I had a uh, Stephanie Webb come out and take some professional photos of my mares because, like, yeah. they're going to be my breeding program. And it was an eye-opener of, like, the exact things that she could see to make these pictures uh-huh. successful that, like, there's no way I'm I'm able to do that, even though I know these horses. Like, And I've actually had right. people buy horses from me that are like, we would have bought this horse six months ago, but your pictures were terrible. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's important it really is yeah I know I'll I'll see some you know I I'm in all the Facebook groups that are like barrel horses for sale and stuff like that just because when I advertise horses for sales we do a lot of sharing into those groups and I'll see pictures of a horse that I know is really nice but they just took kind of a poor picture of it standing in the barn alleyway saddled and I'm like I really want to call them and just be like, hey, I'll come picture your horse and, you know, you'll probably sell it within a couple of days because it looks so good. But, yeah, it's just it's one of those things where you just got to know the difference and and kind of be open to learning and taking constructive criticism on, hey, that is we're not saying your horse looks bad, but we're just saying there's a way to represent it that'll make it look better. So. And then as far as Instagram goes, like, why do you feel like Instagram is also a necessary platform for trainers or events or, you know, stallion owners to have? Yeah. So I will say, like, I took the time to kind of study algorithms and which is basically the way that content travels over the Internet. Okay. And Instagram has a much more open trying to think how to explain this things travel over Instagram a little bit faster than they do on Facebook like you can post a reel and it might go viral that day where over Facebook it might kind of take a couple days to travel you'll get less shares I think and maybe it's kind of a younger generation thing but things travel a lot faster on Instagram because it's easier to share like you can just send it over in a DM to somebody or you can save it And all of those things kind of help your content travel faster into more accounts. So I personally have seen more account reach on Instagram than I have on Facebook. Within the last two years or so, it's really picked up. Are hashtags necessary for Instagram? I'm asking for my own use because I am like as not technology advanced as it gets. And Chelsea and Casey get mad at me all the time because I always mess up my posts. Yeah. But are hashtags necessary? So currently, right now speaking, obviously, like trends change a lot over time, but hashtags right now are kind of out. They actually say, and I've kind of experimented this on my own posts and stuff on my own page, the more hashtags you use now, the less views you get. So Mm. I've made some posts recently where I use no hashtags and they have traveled so much farther because You can actually, if you have a business page, you can go look and see where a lot of your views derived from, and it'll tell them whether they were followers, non-followers from the explore page, you know, or from hashtags. And the hashtags amount is very, very low. Hmm. So they've kind of edged those out recently. It could change. You never know what the algorithm's going to do. You can kind of try to predict it a little bit, but right now they're not that relevant. Okay. And then what about TikTok? So TikTok is a little different. My business account actually got hacked. So I had to just start a new one and start all over. I had like 60,000 followers on the other one. But um, 
I, so if you're curious, I would say TikTok is not as secure. And if your account gets hacked, you're probably not going to get it back. But I have found that TikTok is kind of a good addition to the other social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram, but I wouldn't rely on getting business off of it. Okay. I've just found that the algorithm on TikTok doesn't really reach the people that you need to reach in order to gain customers, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like in marketing, oh, I think a lot of people get confused and they kind of think that marketing is just posting stuff on the internet and hoping it goes viral. But personally, I don't really have the goal of going viral. Like when people hire me, my goal is to grow their business and to target a certain audience. Um, and I've just found on TikTok that you don't really get that. Like you can go viral, but you might reach a million people in China. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they're probably not going to come buy your horse. You know, you might get one or two bites off of it. But as far as like, when you're really focusing on marketing, I wouldn't say TikTok is a big player in that. Okay. I also know besides just like stallions, you, you know, handle sales. What are some of the things that people can do to like help get their horse sale ready as far as advertising goes? Like how do you utilize those things when they're in public sales or even if they're just privately sold? Yeah. I mean, the first steps is getting a good sale, you know, confirmation picture of your horse, because everyone is going to ask for that. Um, the second step is probably videos. If you're talking barrel horses or, you know, a performance horse, they're going to want to see a little bit of what they're about. Um, as far as marketing goes, like if you're just, you know, a hobby barrel racer or somebody that doesn't do it for a profession, if you don't have a business page set up for that, I would recommend looking into working with someone like myself or another agency that markets horses, you know, for a living or has a platform for that because I feel like I see a lot of people, you know, they get the pictures done and then they just post them on their personal page and then it doesn't travel really well. And mm -hmm. they're like, well, I didn't get my horse sold or I didn't get what I wanted for my horse in the auction. I don't feel like I had any customers for it. Because they're just limited, you know, to the friends that they've had on Facebook since 2009. You know, they've already seen your horse. If they were interested in it, they would have come bought it. You need to kind of get the horse out there to new eyes, you know, people that haven't seen it before and people that are going to be interested in it. So, you know, you can share them to groups and different sites and stuff. And I would go outside of Facebook, you know, use Google ads and and I know a lot of people aren't educated and stuff like that, but that's just, I would look into some broader horizons like that. Yeah. I have no idea what you mean by Google ads. And I'm probably embarrassed to say that <laughs> considering I have multiple yeah. avenues of businesses I should be advertising. Yeah. It's, it's something that a lot of people don't know about. And that's why I was really excited, honestly, when you called me to do this, because there is so much like that goes into marketing that people just aren't even aware of and they can really utilize and, and help their businesses grow. So, so what is a Google ad? Like what is a that? Google ad? Is, yeah. So if you have a website or even if you go to post like a horse on barrel horse worlds, you can type in certain like targeted audiences and stuff and you can pay Google. It's called SEO. Like you, if you have a website, you type in keywords and stuff. So when people Google those keywords, your ads will pop up. Okay. So if I, if I submit a Google ad through my website, Elite Econ Promotions, and I can go in the back end of things and type in a bunch of keywords like horse for sale, horses in Texas, horses in Nebraska, up, like horse sale, just stuff like that. And then people Google that or even type it in on Facebook your your Google ads will pop up. Okay. Now I understand what they mean by SEO. <laughs> I yeah. never understand when yeah. the girls are talking about that.
We're going to take a break from this episode to tell you about our sponsors at Cactus Saddlery. Cactus Saddlery is the industry's leading saddle maker with all saddles and straps handmade in the United States. With 150 years of combined saddle making skills, Cactus Saddlery provides premium saddles, tack, pads, and equine accessories designed, developed, and ridden by the professionals of our sport. Fit, quality, looks, and personalized customer service are the expectations. Cactus Saddlery offers a full line of equine products to satisfy everyone from pleasure riders to professional competitors like Mr. Trevor Brazil and his relentless line of saddles from Cactus Saddlery. For more information, visit CactusSaddlery.com. I like how you said a good confirmation shot in addition to action shots, because I see a lot of yeah. people that, I mean, there's cool action shots, but like even on studs that like you literally only see their front feet running through the side of their mm-hmm. graphic. And it's like, well, where, where's the rest of the horse? So, um, walk us through kind of those must do's or do not do when you're setting up a good confirmation picture. The most important thing is that you can see all four legs Um, because number one, it just looks silly. If you can't see one of their back legs, it looks like they're standing on one leg. Um, And the next reason for that is because people are going to ask, you know, a lot of, so online sales are super prominent now. Mm -hmm. And the ones that Mm -hmm. I work for, we require people to send in like close up pictures of their horse's legs, even if they're not professional pictures. We just want to know what they look like. If you're taking a professional confirmation picture, it's super important that you can see all four legs. I have a very specific way of setting horses up. Um, And it also kind of depends on what the discipline of the horse is. But no matter what the discipline is, you don't want the horse, you know, leaned way forward over their toes or leaned way back like they're shying away from you. You kind of want the weight evenly distributed on all four legs and You want them to look natural. You don't want them to look like their head's way up in the air or way down low. But, you know, we set up barrel horses differently than we set up cow horses or rangers or cutters. So you kind of have to think about the discipline and the people you're trying to attract to. But those are kind of the most important things I think about whenever I'm taking pictures of horses. So what are some of those differences between like barrel horses and the other industries? So the people that... I kind of help take pictures. I tell them to think about where the horse, where the horse's head is best positioned, like when they're performing. So if you think about a reining horse, their head is a little bit lower than their withers and it's probably kind of curved down a little bit. That's like their natural state of where they carry their head. Um, A rope horse or a barrel horse, their head's probably up just a little bit above their withers, but not, you know, crazy high up in the air, but they naturally have their shoulders up and their head up just a little bit and then like cow horses and cutters their heads you know when they're working a cow it's pretty level or maybe just a little bit lower so that's kind of just how I like to explain it to people is you just think about where they naturally carry their head and then obviously you make them look good from there I find that really interesting just because then obviously it pulls the eye of like you said the people that might be most interested in buying that horse like Mm -hmm. that's what you want Um, as as far as graphic design goes, what are some of the rules that you follow, like creating graphic designs? Cause you, again, that's just like eye catching, but then also not overwhelming. Like kind of, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we all, all, as far as graphic designers go, we all kind of have our own style. Mine is a little bit more minimalist, modern. Um, I think it's important to highlight, you know, the information. If you're, I guess if you're making a stallion ad or an event flyer or anything like that, but um, whenever you have like a picture of a horse on a graphic, I think it's really important to not do too much editing to it. You know, people try to put crazy backgrounds on there and stuff. And then I have a lot of attention to detail so I notice when you know somebody chopped a horse's leg off and it doesn't look like it's just naturally there so I try not to change the appearance of the horse whenever I'm making graphics you just kind of want to put the information around them in a aesthetically pleasing way but then also just make it easy for the people to understand what you're trying to 
promote when you're making graphics. Obviously, it's cool to know, you know, add special effects and stuff like that, but you don't want to make it too busy. And then as far as print advertising goes, I mean, how can people best utilize like print advertising? Because I feel like, um, you know, that's an investment that some people may not use anymore because it's all social media, but like, what is the importance of also getting like name recognition out there through print publications? Right. Yeah. Um, I think it still is important. You know, um, I still run quite a few print ads, mainly for stallions and stuff. Those are pretty prominent. Um, in some, you know, breeding type magazines, you wouldn't believe the people that actually still order magazines to their home. Maybe it's not a lot of young people, but there is still a pretty good audience out there for it. So whenever I'm making an ad for a print magazine or something like that, I kind of take into consideration how long it's going to be around. So you want to have relevant information on there, but you also don't want to put something on there that in five months it's going to change. Like, for example, if you're running a, a early breeding special on a stud, and the magazine goes out in January, well, you just cost yourself probably $500 to $1,000 and missed the opportunity there because it was too late. But yeah, I, w- I would say, I guess the majority of my print ads are for studs. So we try to do them before breeding season too. We think about like the time frame on stuff and like when to send out print ads. So I think that's kind of important too. Do you do any other type of like advertising, like swag or anything like that to help with those names? Or do you focus mainly on like the the media aspect of it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I recommend to a lot of my customers to have like jackets, vests, hats made to give out to people, you know, because when you're walking around the horse shows and you see a horse's name or a breeding operations name on the back of a vest, it just kind of becomes relevant and it familiarizes people with it. And then they're more likely to do business with you in the future. If they see your name everywhere, you know, they say people have to see things so many times before they really become familiar with it and engage with it. And then hopefully they'll become a customer. So, yeah, I mean, and two, like we have, people that sponsor events and they have banners in the arena. That's another way to get your name out there or they run commercials. Like there's just so many different avenues and ways to market your business outside of social media. So besides stallions, um, overall, like ranch promotion or trainer promotion, that's one thing that I've really noticed on like the team roper side of things is that there's like, Some Mm -hmm. trainers that are, you know, specifically highlight their training program, not even if it's just like one specific course, like kind of what are your thoughts on that and the professional videos to kind of help elevate like creation of your brand? Yeah, I think it's super important. I mean, I personally have quite a few training clients and I've just gotten a lot of positive feedback on it, honestly, like from their customers or people that have become customers because they saw, you know, some stuff that they did on Facebook. Like they might have seen a video of a guy working with a horse and they were like, well, I really like his technique. So I'm going to talk to him about putting some horses in training or even, you know, sponsors. Sponsors love to see their endorsees on social media doing great things and getting interaction. So I just think it's a great investment for people. Like if they really want to grow their program or stay relevant, you know, get more clients, get more sponsors. I think it's a great way to kind of draw people to your business. And I call it an investment because ideally it does, you know, have a return on it. Yeah. You know, you'll get more horses training you'll get sponsors you'll get more you know the clients really are who I get a lot of feedback from they just love seeing their horses you know they don't all live right down the road so if you make them happy they're probably going to bring you another one for next year and it just goes full circle that's a great way to put it because that is one thing that um you know some of my stud owners like I've talked to and they're like well it's just so expensive um Mm -hmm. which it Yeah, it can be, but like you said, and if it brings you more business and more than covers its cost, then like, what's 
you know, obviously well worth the trade off. Talk a little bit about like the financial investment somebody could put in like, Hey, if you want like bare basics, somebody to handle it, you might invest $5,000. If you want a website, this, you know, like kind of what can people expect to invest to really build that brand? Um, It all obviously varies, you Mm -hmm. know, on the client and kind of how much they have to work with. So whenever I have somebody come to me personally, I try to get to know their business first before I can actually quote them. Um, You know, it can be as little as a couple hundred dollars a month if you're just looking to maintain. But, you know, if you have a large program that you're trying to promote, it's probably going to cost you a couple thousand dollars a month. But like I said, I think it's worth it because eventually it's all going to come full circle. And I tell people whenever they have sale horses and I tell them what it costs to get them pictured, I just tell them like, look, you're going to get it back because if you spend $500 or you know $250, that's one extra bid on your horse. You just have to mm-hmm. get one extra bid for it to be worth it. And like, I promise you, you're definitely going to get more than just one bid. So one bit extra. So, I mean, it it just makes sense when you put it that way, because you are doing, you're doing yourself that much better to take the step to make the investment versus just limiting yourself and just trying to do it on your own. I always think it's worth to hire the professional. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And if somebody's like trying to prepare, like, is there a better time of year? Obviously, you want horses shed off. Like, do you do videos at home? Like, what can people kind of start preparing for before reaching out to like, somebody like yourself to kind of help with that program? Yeah, I mean, we we do sell horses year round and stuff. You kind of have to do what you can. Most horses in training, you know, trainers have them under lights and stuff and have them slicked off. But as far as taking pictures of the horse and stuff you really just need to have them fitted up as best you can and then like when I show up to picture them I just want them to be clipped and clean you know Mm -hmm. it's amazing when you show up to places and they haven't even bathed the horse yet and I'm like hey uh, we kind of need to like clean it up a little bit just so we can make it look you know the best that it can because you can make a, a good horse look really bad if you don't do the proper preparation and stuff. But I'm not saying they have to be totally slicked off because people are understanding too. I mean, if it's December and you live in Idaho and you have a horse for sale, people are going to understand that it's not totally slicked off. Mm -hmm. Um, They might be more attracted to a horse that's been in North Texas under lights. But for the most part, I mean, people like me, we can still make those horses look attractive to the public. If we were talking to people that say, say they didn't have a couple thousand dollars to start off the bat, mm-hmm. but like, what are yeah. some things that you're like, you can do this, you might have to work harder, but you can do it yourself. But like, here's some tips and tricks to capitalize on what you can. Creating your own Facebook and Instagram, or TikTok, whatever social media account, like you said, it's free. They can do that on their own. They can get on there and talk about their program and invite their friends to follow them and familiarize with them. And you can tell them to invite their friends to like the page and to kind of familiarize yourself with that. Like you don't necessarily have to hire someone to tell the public about your program. When you hire someone like me, we're just making it, you know, we're just taking it up the next step and making it look even better and kind of adding some flair to it. Mm -hmm. Um, I have customers who run their own pages, you know, they're like, well, we just need the content and then we can post it. We can handle posting it from there if you just supply us with the content. So that's always an option too. I mean, if you're, if you have, you know, a family member or somebody that savvies the whole Facebook deal, maybe you just need to hire somebody to come out and get you some content to work with. And then you can kind of try to build it that way until you're ready to take the next step and and really see it grow. Okay. I love it. I think that's all just such valuable advice. Um, What else? What else are we missing? I I know I told you, like, I don't even know 100% the right questions to ask, but what else can people do (laughs) to make sure they are doing, they are capitalizing on marketing their program? I would just always focus on the quality and honesty. Honesty is huge um, because Ideally, when you're trying to promote your business and stuff, 
obviously it's good to be honest and have a good reputation and you want your horses to be presented how they actually look, you know, and I think that's why it's important if you can to hire a professional that's going to accurately represent your horse that way whenever people show up it's kind of like what you see is what you get um whether it's a stallion or a sale horse and it goes for trainers too i mean just be honest with people and another big thing is people that follow your pages they want to feel like they know you on a personal level right like it's not really like there's some celebrity obviously there's some studs out there that people show up and they're like oh my gosh he's famous like that's that's cool but as far as like programs and trainers and stuff like that like just being a good person and i think it's important to um interact with your followers too okay because number one that doesn't only just help your page grow like the more you interact with people liking comments, responding to their comments, you know, messaging them back is a huge thing. Like I manage so many pages, it's kind of hard to always answer the messages, but it's worth it because people really value that. Like if you take the time from a business page to answer someone's message, even if they're just saying like, I really like this run or something, you send them a message back, they're more apt to keep you know interacting with you and that just helps your page grow so just stuff like that really goes a long way and if you don't have time to do something like that that's why a lot of people hire marketing professionals is because they don't have time to sit there and interact with everybody on facebook you know like i know in the rope horse industry a lot of the wives will be the one to hire a social media manager because they're like I don't have time to sit here and message these people back and, and talk to them about this and talk to them about that. And I'm like, well, I do. Cause that's my job, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so Great point. It, it's just, I, I like to, um, I like to interact with people on those pages because they, they become customers, you know, they buy breedings or they come to the event and I've just, I've seen it work. So Awesome. And tell us, um, before we wrap up, I know that you have done a little bit in the barrel racing world and kind of like what you've seen using your methods to like in our side of the industry. Yeah. So, um, primarily I've done a lot of work with the BFA sale that's held in conjunction with the barrel futurities of America event in November. And, um, it was a couple of years ago when I started, you know, I was just doing the social media for the sale and we didn't have a lot of people send in pictures and we didn't have a lot of people, you know, send in stuff for us to use to advertise for the sale. So I was just kind of creating content. And then I had a client that I was taking pictures of the sale horses for. And that year, primarily those horses did significantly better than the ones that we didn't have as much content on. And I remember we had some really, really cool horses consigned to the sale. We just didn't have that much content on them to really promote them to the public. But within the last year or so, we've had more people, you know, send in stuff or hire me to come take pictures of the horses. And the last two years at the BFA sale, I mean, if anybody was there or saw the results online, it's gotten exponentially better. So I'm really excited to kind of see the barrel horse industry grow. I think it will. I think there's more people kind of getting into the marketing and stuff. They Mm -hmm. maybe just have to see it work first. So I'm excited to be a part of that, you know, with the BFA sale. And if other companies kind of want to jump on board there, like I said, I think they will. You know, the pink buckle and the ruby buckle, they're all, their marketing is really kind of starting to turn on and they've had some really good sales and stuff. So I just think as more people see it and they see it work, they'll kind of buy into it. I just don't think over the last couple of years, they've maybe been a little bit doubtful of it, but I think it's going to kind of turn on over the next five years and hopefully we see growth in it. Like we've seen in the rope horse industry and in other things too. So, yeah, I love that. And what a great example, um, because I've noticed that and I didn't even realize you were a part of that. Um, But to to BFA, because we always discuss like how the market's doing, if the economy matters, Mm -hmm. you know, all that type of stuff. And that's kind of where my stance has always been is like, we have so many great bread horses now that like, 
yeah, that is the, that bar is being raised. And so now if you have a really well-bred horse, but you don't promote it above and beyond what you normally would, it's not going to bring the money that you think it's worth because there's 150 other equally as great bred horses out there. So it's like, we right. all have to right. take a step up. And then, you know, once you highlight that horse and do it professionally and get it out there, like, then you're going to get what it's worth. It's just now it takes a little bit more work to, to highlight them in the right way. Yeah, that's a good point too, especially when you're looking at going to a sale like the BFA sale or the Pink Buckle, where there's so many good horses in one spot. You might have the best horse there, but if you didn't advertise it and get it out there as much as maybe one of the other ones, it's going to be on the lower end. You know, obviously there's people that do their research and they try to find the best one in the sale, but the other large majority is they're going to see the one that they saw on Facebook and they loved the picture of it. And that's the stall they're going to go to when they get to the horse sale. And that's the horse they're going to buy because they fell in love with it last week when they saw it on Facebook or whatever, you know? So, so I think when you've got that horse that's special and that's worth it and it's important to you to get what it's worth, I think it's worth the investment to advertise it and to really get it out there because it's going to come full circle and your investment's going to be returned. So. I love it. I love it. I don't know if I have any more ideas, but we might have to do a follow-up. One of our listeners do. So thank you so much for um, just walking us through it. I loved it. Yeah. I I hope everyone kind of maybe can learn something from it. And if anybody has any more questions, they can reach out to me, but I think, uh, I don't know. I'm just excited. Like I said, to see kind of where the industry goes over the next couple of years, I think we're going to see some good things come from it. So I was glad I got to talk a little bit about it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kenzie. I appreciate you and um, we'll be in touch. Thank you all for listening to today's episode brought to you by our partners at Cactus Saddlery. You can learn more at cactussaddlery.com or call 903-441-0700. Amanda and Josh over there, they will help you. They will put in your custom order and they will make your dreams come true in the saddle department. That is cactussaddlery.com.